Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. In an earlier episode, we made several mistakes, and while we had a correction of one of them in the video itself, the other mistake was simply wrong, and I hope to put that right. What I feel a little bad about was me repeating a myth without labeling it as such. At the time, we did not know this, but we've learned a lot more since then. The error about the difference in the rail gauge between that of Russia today and other countries sort of sneaked past us. When our lead writer, Lisa, went to find out more about this, she made a number of discoveries. As our program is called Railway Legends Myths and Stories, this time it is a myth we want to go after. So if you will now bear with us, today I want to look a bit more about the Russian question. Let's take another look at Imperial Russian rail history and the question of Russian rail gauges. In the early part of the 19th century, the then Prince Nicholas, later to be Tsar Nicholas I, had traveled the world. When he visited England in 1817, he caught the rail bug. There, he had seen the wonders of early steam engines. Like many, Nicholas wanted to ride the footplate of one of those steam engines. Being a royal prince has its advantages. It was not hard to get an invitation for a ride on the locomotive, and he even went so far as to happily shovel coal into the firebox. This shows that anyone can be a railway enthusiast. The usefulness and power that railways could bring certainly made a great impression upon the soon-to-be Russian ruler. Once Nicholas became Tsar in 1825, there certainly would be steam railways in Russia. The early 19th century was a time in Russia when technical expertise almost always came from outside of Russia. In 1834, the Austrian Czech engineer Franz Anton von Gerstner was commissioned to look into the possibilities of building railroads in Russia. He made a great study and traveled extensively. He could see the great possibility, so he drew up a grand rail plan. In 1835, he submitted these ideas to the Tsar. These were for a railway from St. Petersburg to Moscow and then on to Kazan. Grand plans indeed. But it was decided that a demonstration line was needed. So a much shorter line was laid out from St. Petersburg to Tsarsko Selo. Thus, building of the first steam railway line in Russia was started on the 1st of May, 1836, and after only 17 months of construction and after numerous test runs in October 1837, the first trains left St. Petersburg for the royal residence at Tsarsko Selo. This was the beginning of the Tsarsko Selo Railway. The locomotives were all imported from England and Belgium, as well as many carriages. These were divided into luxurious types, such as the Berliner class, to second, third, and roofless fourth class carriages. The Zarskoselsky Railway was built 27 kilometers long and to a wide gauge of 1829 millimeters. So why 1829? Because Franz von Gerstner had picked it out. Remember what I said in our video on gauge. Somewhere, somewhere, sometimes said the gauge will be this. And in this case, he must have had really wide arms. The simple truth is it all came about due to some convenience of his calculations. Simply, he picked it. The line was not only laid out at a wide gauge, it was built to a very high quality. How well the line was built can be seen by the fact that it reached speeds of more than 60 kilometers per hour, with an average closer to 50. While today you might not think of that as all this fast, but in 1837 it was beyond most people's belief. What once had been an all-day hike or a long, hard ride in a wagon was now done in as little as 35 minutes. While some people disparaged the railway as merely Tsar Nikolai I's toy, this might be worth some debate. It must be noted that in its first year of operation, the line carried more than 700,000 passengers. 
What is true is that this short first railway did give valuable experience to the St. Petersburg Corps of Railway Engineers. The second Russian railway project, again by order of the Tsar, was also done with outside engineering. This time it was the Warsaw to Vienna Railway in Poland. At the time, Poland was under Russian control. Construction of this line began in 1839, and this line was built to a gauge of 1435 millimeters. Due to financial issues, the line took longer than it was first planned to complete, as work was halted in 1842 when the funds ran out. Later, with help from the Imperial Treasury, the project was finally completed in 1848. Soon, there were plans for a railway from St. Petersburg to Moscow. While this line might be thought of as the second line, and it is true that it is the second in Russia proper, it was still the third built by Imperial Russia. So, myth-breaking time. You may ask, how was and why was the Russian gauge set? At first, Colonel P. P. Melenkov of the Construction Commission had planned to use the wide gauge of 1829 millimeters of the Zarskoselsky Railway. There were concerns raised about the cost. So what do you do? What most operations do? Hire a consultant. Petrovich Melenkov and Nikolai Ospovich Kraft, who were professors from the St. Petersburg Corps of Transportation Engineers, traveled to the United States to learn more about rail building. In America, they talked with many railway engineers. On their return to Russia, they recommended the American railway engineer George Washington Whistler. So in 1842, Whistler went to Russia on a seven-year contract. George Whistler was born on the 19th of May, 1800, and was the son of the famous painter of the equally famous painting often called Whistler's Mother. George graduated from the United States Military Academy and was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1819. The United States Military Academy was the finest school of engineering in America. In 1822, he was a topographical engineer with the Artillery Corps. He also worked at the Topographic Bureau and did surveys for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. In 1827, joined his brother-in-law, William Gibbs McNeil, and became a member of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad's Board of Civil Engineers. Although still in the Army the following year, together with other engineers, he traveled to England. Being welcomed by the British Institute of Civil Engineers, they met with many of the most eminent engineers of the day. The American engineers visited the Stockton and Darlington Railway, where they examined and learned all they could from the most advanced steam railway of its day. Returning to America with a great deal of new information on both steam and rail operations, Whistler then worked on many of the early American railways. The Russians had hired someone with a wealth of railway knowledge. One of the first things to be looked at was ways to cut construction costs. One of the easiest ways to lower the cost is to build to a narrower gauge. At first, the 1435 Stevenson gauge was looked at. But what is not well understood in most histories is that this consultant came from America. At that time, there was yet to be one established standard gauge in the United States. There was a fair size gauge war going on. So it happened that there were many different gauges across America. So at the time, no single gauge was the clear standard. We may go into this American gauge war on another video sometime later. So how was the Russian gauge picked? Drum roll, please. The consulting engineer George Washington Whistler was a big proponent of the 1524 millimeter gauge, and this was the gauge that he personally had great faith in. There was a lot of trackage in America at the time at a gauge of 1524 millimeters. I am not sure of the total amount of American 1524 gauge at the time Whistler left for Russia, but by 1885, there was more than 18,000 kilometers of 1524 millimeter gauge track in the USA. Thus, there is more than ample evidence that the pick of 1524 was one of simple popularity. So big surprise, Whistler suggested that the Russians use 1524 millimeter. And once the Tsar agreed, that was that. <laughs>
This was sort of a compromise between the 1829 millimeter and 1435 millimeter gauges. The 1524 gauge gave many of the cost advantages, but was still somewhat wide. There had been no plans for there to be a connection to Western European railways, so no thought of a break of gauge was considered at the time. In fact, in Russian terms, the picking of the gauge was a pretty minor matter. One of the things for which Whistler was most remembered in Russia was his bridge building. In America, some of Whistler's bridges are still in service. In engineering terms, it was he who brought the Howe Truss Bridge to Russia. The Russians spent a lot of energy developing the Howe Truss for use in building rail bridges. So the railway from St. Petersburg to Moscow would be built at a gauge of 1,524 millimeters. Not only was it to be built to a broader gauge than the 1435 millimeter gauge, this approximately 640 kilometer track was being built as a double track railway. It was clearly a first class build. I tripped myself up upon this one. It is a widely held notion that Russia chose a gauge different than the 1435 millimeter Stevenson gauge for military reasons. Upon further study, this does not appear to be the case. A Russian army engineer wrote in 1841 a paper stating that such a danger did not exist since railways could easily be made dysfunctional by any retreating force. The proof that railways could be destroyed or made unusable by any retreating force has been proven many times, especially in both the American Civil War and World War II, when German forces also tore up vast amounts of track. The myth is also based on the idea that they feared invasion, and while this might be true, no great power at the time would admit to that. At the top of all this was that early in the 19th century, so the thought of using a railroad in war had not really occurred to anyone. On the other hand, the speed at which railways can be laid is also well known, particularly in places they already existed. There is no contemporary evidence that military considerations had anything to do with the choice of gauge. On the contrary, this explanation of the Russian gauge in retrospect ends up looking something like Roman chariots being used as the basis for the standard railway gauge. Now building just one line to one specific gauge does not set things in stone. However, the Alexandrovsk State Factory near St. Petersburg was re-equipped to produce locomotives on the 1524 millimeter gauge. Again, it is no surprise that this venture was done with foreign engineering expertise. Also from America came engineers Andrew M. Eastwick and Joseph Harrison, Jr. of Philadelphia, later joined by Baltimore engineer Thomas Winnens. These engineers had already produced many locomotives in the New World. Now they brought their experience to the old. They had a $3 million contract to build rolling stock. With the experience of the American engineers, the state factory produced more than 100 locomotives, as well as thousands of freight wagons and as many as 70 passenger coaches. Once up and in operation, it was like so many other places, where once you had built to one gauge, there was little reason to change. Sadly, in 1847, Whistler contracted cholera, dying two years before the line was completed. After the line's opening in 1850, Joseph Harrison returned to the United States very wealthy. Andrew Eastwick also returned home and retired. It should come as no surprise that in 1860, by government decree, all future rail lines in Russia would be 1524 millimeter. Incidentally, the original Zarskofelsky railway stayed with its 1829 millimeter gauge until nearly the end of the 19th century when it was changed to the 1524 millimeter gauge. We hope this debunks the often repeated myth of why the gauge in Russia was set the way it is. Well, except for that pesky four millimeters. In our episode about gauges, I said that this area was all 1524 millimeter with a text overlay saying it was actually 1520 millimeters, which was which? Well, Russia was originally all 1524, 
from 1843 until the 1970s. In the 1970s, the Soviet Union decided that there was a need to re-gauge the railroad. This change took more than 20 years. Why the change? Well, that is a very good question. At the time, there were two directions of thought to improve the stability of trains. One was to widen the gauge to 1528 millimeters, and the other was to narrow it to 1520 millimeters. The hows and whys of this we still don't really know. Some say it was narrowed to reduce wheel wear. Others said it needed to be widened to reduce wheel wear. In the end, some Soviet officials said narrow it, and narrowed it was. The upshot and small bright spot was that the difference was small enough that there was no need to replace rolling stock. In 2017, we made a trip to Finland and had a chance to visit the Finnish National Rail Museum. One of the great artifacts at the museum is the only remaining Russian royal carriages. These carriages date to before the Russian Revolution. At one time, Finland was part of the Greater Russian Empire and it had the same track gauge as the rest of the area under Russian imperial rule. Today, Finland still works on a 1524 millimeter gauge, while Russia is officially 1520. And until it was suspended due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there were transborder services with the same equipment operating in both Finland and Russia. We hope that we can now lay the Russian gauge myth to rest. And as always, we'll see you on the train.